All right, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm Robert Heath. This is lecture number eight of the Wireless Communications Lab. And today we're going to talk about um, a couple of different topics. One is uh, optimum pulse shape design. And so we're going to formulate an optimization problem and determine the pulse shape that um, solves that problem there. And so you should be able to determine that pulse shape yourself, both at the transmitter and receiver for the additive white Gaussian noise channel. And then second, we're going to look at the class of pulse shapes that satisfy that optimality problem. And these are called Nyquist pulse shapes. And it's very related to Nyquist sampling theorem. And then here, you know, you should be able to describe trade-offs between bandwidth, excess bandwidth, and sampling frequency of the raised cosine pulse shape. And that's one of the most common pulse shapes. And then second, be able to determine if a given pulse shape satisfies the Nyquist pulse shape criterion. So those are the two important things you should get from that lecture. And then finally, we will talk about how to implement pulse shaping at the transmitter using um, some concepts from multi-rate signal processing. And then, depending on how much time we have, let's see, this looks blurry here. Depending on how much time we have, we will uh, also talk about how to do it at the receiver. So, let's see. Okay, so let's get started with um, a quick review of the system thus far. So I'm putting this up here just to save me and you from possibly writing this down again. But um, this is the specific digital communication system that we're considering right now in the course. Um, so the transmitter, we have the bits coming in, the symbol mapping with an input for the constellation. The last lecture we talked about constellations and um, how to plot them how to normalize them. And then this create pulse train block, that's the block that's somehow converting a discrete time sequence into something that's continuous time. And then the GTX of T, which is our transmit pulse shaping filter. And this is um, what we're going to be focusing on optimizing today. And then finally, there's the square root of EX, which is the um, transmit energy. And then at the receiver, we're going to also adopt a similar looking structure here the first piece is the receive filter. So we're also going to work on optimizing this today, followed by a symbol rate sampling. And so that's important to remember because um, when we talk about how to implement pulse shaping, we'll also have a um, Nyquist sampling operation as well. The detection block, which we'll talk about next Monday, and then the inverse symbol mapping, which just is the reverse of the, the symbol mapping operation, which we won't talk anymore about here. So the main focus today is going to be on these, these two um, pulse shaping filters here. Now, you might wonder where this whole structure here comes from. And there's um, you know, a piece of detection theory that we're omitting. So you have to sort of take on, on faith here that this is the right looking structure here for this problem. Um, and this is the appropriate structure for the additive white Gaussian noise channel, which looks like signal plus noise. Now, if you had any other kinds of impairments, you may want to modify this receiver structure here. And throughout, like, the rest of the course, you know, we're going to add more impairments, and we're going to modify all these different operations here. Essentially, we're going to add a whole lot more here between the sampling and the detection. All right, so that's where we are here. So let's look now at... Um, topic of today, first topic here, which is the pulse shape design here. And so essentially we want to find, you know, some relationship between GTX of T and GRX of T that allows us to identify functions that are good in some sense. And so that's essentially what we're going to do here. Okay, so pulse shape design. So to start off here, we need to look at the um, received signal 
after the filtering operation here. And I'm just looking at my notes here, and I realize that I probably need to update the fil this diagram, because usually I use Y for the output of that match filter. Anyways, um, so we need to, to look at the signal that's after the receive filter. And so let me call that signal y of t. And so writing this out, you know, essentially we have um, the pulse shaping filter here. This, sorry, this is the received filter grx of t is going to convolve our transmitted signal, which is square root of ex sum over n s of n gtx of t minus nt plus noise here. So we are going to filter our transmitted signal plus the noise. And then just carrying through the convolution here, so the convolution of the sum is sum of the convolutions, then we can rewrite this as um, looking at this here. So I'm going to write this as square root of ex, sum over n, s of n. Now what we have right here is, remember that this gt, this operation here is gtx of t, our pulse shaping filter, convolved with that pulse train. So equivalently, I can also convolve this grx with gtx together and then convolve it with this pulse train. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new function g of t. That's the convolution between grx and gtx. I'm going to call that g of t minus nt here. And then I'm going to leave myself the convoluted noise here. So this is where g of t is equal to the convolution between the receive filter and that transmit pulse shape here. So this input-output relationship looks like, again, a complex pulse amplitude modulated signal, except that the pulse shaping filter is a combination of the transmit and receive filters. And the noise, which we started off with as Gaussian white noise assumption, is now um, filtered here. And so that's our observed signal here. And so we're going to take this signal, and then following this block diagram here, we're going to sample it at the symbol rate. And so now let's plug that in here. So sampling at the symbol rate. So that's going to give us y of n. And so if we plug in here, when we're sampling, remember sampling, we're just plugging in nt here. Now I have to be a little bit careful because I, I used the n variable here. because That's my favorite index. So I'm going to change that to m. So you have to sum over ex here. So I'm going to write that as the sum of m, s of m. And now here's where I'm going to put my g of nt minus mt plus. Now here I've got this grx of t convolved with v of t sampled at t equals nt. So I'm not going to deal with that quite yet here. OK, so let's look at the, um, the terms here. So first of all, I can rewrite this a little bit here to pull out something that we want. So um, we've got at y of n here g of 0 times s of n. Because look at the sum. I have the sum over all m here. And for m equals 0, I get, or sorry, for m equals n, I get s of n plus the sum for m not equal to n, s of m, g of n minus m, t, and again, plus this noise term here, grx of t, convolved with v of t, sampled at n t here. So this right here, in this, um, in the channel model that we've got thus far, what we would like to do is we would like to be able to detect s of n from 
the sample Y of N here. This is called a memory list detector. And this is, this is, at this point, what we would like to do here. And so this is going to be our signal term here. This right here is not noise. It's other signals. And this has a special name that we call intersymbol interference. And uh, intersymbol interference is abbreviated as ISI. And so we'll see intersymbol interference come up in different ways in the course. So this is just the first um, of what will be uh, several lectures that deal with it here. And this here is noise. And so what we want to do is we want to somehow pull out the signal here from this intersymbol interference and noise. And what we have control over right now is the transmit and receive pulse shaping filter. That's really all. So we're going to try to find a, a filter that somehow gives us this, reduces the effects of this here. OK, so to do that now, we're going to formulate a optimization problem here. So what we're going to do is we are going to suppose that we're going to, first of all, we're going to treat the inner symbol interference as noise, as a kind of noise. And we're going to write a signal power to interference plus noise power ratio. And we're going to try to maximize that. So that's the procedure here. The idea being that I've explained that having a large SNR is good. And so presumably, if intersymbol interference is noise, is like noise, then having a high signal to interference plus noise ratio is good. So that's, that's kind of the, the premise of the approach we're taking here. And so let's look at the. Um, this here would be, right, yeah, so coming back here. So effectively, at this point here, we have Y of N, S of N, and this stuff here. So we're actually going to look at the, the variance of each of these terms here. Now everything here is zero mean, so we just have to look at the expectation of the amplitude squared. And that's going to be our proxy for, for energy or power here. So we're going to look at the... Um, Signal energy, which we're going to write as the expectation of this first term, which is square root of EX, S of N, G of 0, magnitude squared. And the only thing random here is the S, so we can put a little S here. And then this is a constant, that's a constant, so we get EX, magnitude of G0 squared, times expectation of S of n magnitude squared, which is what? What is the expectation of S of n magnitude squared? It's 1 by um, the construction of our constellations. So that's the signal term here. Now let's look at the noise term. So we're going to get expectation of... Um, this funny looking quantity here, which is GRX of T convolved with V of T sampled at NT magnitude squared. And here we can use um, essentially a connection between um, energy in continuous in discrete time, and we can rewrite this as the integral of, so n naught times the integral for g of rx of f, and magnitude squared df here. Where this comes from here is that what I'm doing with this convolution is I'm taking my white noise here, which has power spectral density, this thing here of n naught. And then I'm convolving it with this filter GRX, so my power spectral density is going to be looking, you know, something like this here. And then now I'm going to take all of the energy in this here and associate that there with the, the noise. And there, there's, um, yeah, there's one step here that I'm, 
that I'm missing that I think I'm covering in the, in the book. But um, let's keep going here. So this is the inner symbol interference term is going to be the expectation of that funny looking sum. So we've got the square root of ex, the sum over m not equal to n, s of m, g of n minus m t, magnitude squared. So we're summing over m not equal to m here. And then, so this is going to be ex. Now, we can um, go through here, and I'll, I'll write out this step here, just so you see the, the little step here. But whenever you have an expectation of this magnitude squared, um, the most straightforward approach here is to expand out, multiply it together. But you have to remember the index here. Because when you have a magnitude squared, you have two separate sums, not one. So you have to update the index. So we're going to multiply this as the sum over m1, not equal to n, s of m1, g of n minus m1 of t times the sum over m2, s of m2, g of n minus m2, t here. The n stays the same, but the m2 um, is different. And then now we just use the property that the expectation of m1 times m2, and, and this whole thing actually should be conjugated here, then that's because the symbol sequence is also assumed to be IID, is going to be 1 times delta of m1 minus n2. That means m1 is equal to m2, and so that gives us ex sum over m not equal to 0, this squared. So it's g of, this should be sum over n, no, it's g of mt. Yeah, so it's going to be g of m. Here, hold on a second here. What am I missing here? M. Yeah, because we can arbitrarily change the index here. So it's going to be sum over, yeah, this is m not equal to m. Yeah, okay, all right. Squared. Okay, and so then this is just, again, expanding, and then this is exploiting IID property and simplifying the sum here. And so what we get at the end is, first of all, look, we have an EX here. This is important because this is a function of the symbols. And so the more power the symbols have, the more inner symbol interference power has. That makes sense. And what we have here is, essentially, this is the contributions from this sampled filter at all times other than zero. And so that's literally what the inner symbol interference is. And we're going to see this kind of a term come up later here. But so the intuition here is that any tap of this filter g of t that is non-zero at some symbol interval is going to add up and create uh, interference for us. So now what we're going to do is we're going to write this whole thing together as one SINR expression. And so we're going to write ex of g of 0 squared divided by ex sum over m not equal to 0 g of mt squared plus this noise quantity here, which is n naught integral g of rx of f df here. OK, so now. Um, what we want to do is we want to make the SINR as big as possible. And so the trick here is to, so, so we're going to optimize S, SINR. Now, if you take uh, an approach based on, like, optimization theory, even just simple calculus, you know, the temptation would be to, to do something like differentiate, set it equal to zero, or, you know, actually we have a constrained problem, so you might have some kind of Lagrangian formulation. Um, this is a bit difficult here because we have two variables, which is GRX and GTX, but they're functions. So we're optimizing over a function, a scalar over functions, which is it's possible, um, it, but they also appear in the numerator and the denominator, and they're convolved together. 
So kind of a direct brute force, let's play with the math and optimize it, doesn't work. So what we're going to do is we're going to find a series of upper bounds on the SINR that we show that we can achieve. So this is a tricky approach for essentially maximizing a quantity here, and it requires you know, having good knowledge of, um, of inequalities. So this is very common in, in optimization theory as a way to avoid having to do a lot of um, lengthy calculations. So first of all, let's, um, I guess I had to, re I had to rewrite this problem here. Uh, okay, EX, G of zero squared, so that's signal divided by N naught times the integral of G RX of F squared DF plus EX sum over m g of mt squared here. So this is our quantity here. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to say, um, okay, so how can we upper bound this function here? So we can upper bound the signal power by making it bigger, potentially, potentially bigger here. So step one is going to be, so let me write, write step one down here. The step one is going to be, let's look at this term here, g is zero. So if we write out g is zero, this is convolution. This is the absolute value of the convolution between g rx of, you know, tau minus t, but tau is zero, so it's going to be blank minus t times gtx of t dt magnitude squared. So what does this mathematically, this operation look like here, if you've seen this before here? So this integral between this product of these two functions. This has a special name. You can ignore the fact that that one is negative. It, it, it's, it's also related to autocorrelation, but specifically, th this is an example of an inner product between two functions. So if you, if you were operating on Hilbert space, the, the space of functions that have finite energy, th this operation acts as an inner product. So you studied inner products and vectors before. This is just an inner product with functions. Um, and so what we can do is we can use the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Does anyone remember Cauchy-Schwartz inequality? Is that the inner product between two vectors? What's the net? Yes. Yeah, so essentially, right, so you have two vectors here. They're inner product. You know, at, at best, their inner, their inner product is maximized when the two vectors are parallel here. And so then that inner product would essentially be the magnitude of each of those vectors multiplied together. Now, we are operating at magnitude squared here. So this is upper bounded by the inner product between GRX of T and itself, which I can write GRX of T here. And I can just get rid of the, the negative because we can flip the sign. It's fine. Just change of variables, and then the inner product of gtx of t here. So this is by, so this is Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. <coughs> and so now we can simplify this here, because what is the integral of this gtx magnitude squared dt? This one is one by assumption because we said we we're going to normalize our transit pulse shape to have unit energy. So that's one here. So this is just equal to the integral of g rx of t here, magnitude squared. And then for later use, we will also need to remember from Parseval's inequality that this is just g rx of f, magnitude squared. Now the important point in, in this upper bound here is that we're saying that G0 can be at best this product here. 
We also need to know when it's achieved. So it's achieved when the two vectors are parallel to each other here. And so it's essentially here it's achieved when GRX of t. Now, the proper inner product would have to have a conjugate here. This, these, these guys could be complex. So this is going to be achieved when GRX is equal to GTX conjugate of minus t. And so this is, and actually I should put a, um, a scalar here, alpha. So this is GRX of t is parallel to GTX of t here. And we have also just an arbitrary complex scalar of that. So it doesn't matter, right? I mean, whenever you have the two lines parallel, you know, one can be a lot bigger than the other. It doesn't matter. So the GRX has to be a flipped and scaled version of the GTX of t. And this is what we call a matched filter. So it's a filter that is matched to this other filter. And it's matched because it converts this convolution into a correlation. And that's going to essentially give us the highest amount of energy. You know, if you're convolving these two functions together, if one is the flip version of the other, you're going to get a big peak there um, when they lie right on top of each other. That's, that's the correlation. So then we come back up here to our SINR function here, and we say, ah, well, this is upper bounded by EX. And then um, I'm going to write this in the frequency domain just because I, I know that that would be more useful. And I'll write this like this here, GRX of F here, 92 squared DF, divided by N naught magnitude GRX of F squared DF plus EX, the sum over M, G of MT, magnitude squared. It's one of those days where I wish I was using PowerPoint slides. Okay, so the second upper bound is actually much easier because what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, you know, I, I am really out of luck here with the noise because no matter what I do to the GRX filter, look, I'm going to do that to my signal too. So I'm pretty much stuck with the noise. But what about this here? Well, what if we just make that zero? So this is upper bounded by EX over N naught. And look, these two quantities here, they cancel. So the, next, the second issue is, so when is this second inequality achieved? This is achieved when the sum over m of g of mt magnitude squared is equal to 0. And this is called the 0 ISI condition. And equivalently, what I'm requiring is, because of um, this, so basically this normalization here. So let me comment here. I forgot to mention this here. I, I did put an alpha in here, but we can take alpha equal to 1. Because whatever we do to the received signal, it doesn't matter. We can scale the received signal by 1,000 or divide it by 1,000. It doesn't change anything because it scales both the signal and noise. So we take the alpha to be 1. Now, if we take alpha to be 1 here, then what happens is that g of 0 is equal to 1. So coming down here, requiring that this sum is equal to 0 and g of 0 is equal to 1. So this is the sum for m not equal to 0. Sorry, that should be not equal 0 here, Effect effectively means that g of nt, so if I take my filter and I sample it, this should be equal to some delta function, delta of n. And so um, this is a very strange function. This is a function that you sample 
and it looks like a discrete time delta. And the question then is, I mean, is this even possible, right? Is this just some weird mathematical anomaly, or can we find such functions? And the answer is yes. And so properties, so such g of t exist and are called Nyquist, um, in this case, Nyquist pulse shapes. You could also call them Nyquist functions. So Nyquist pulse shapes. So to summarize here, what, what we've done is we have, um, we look at the received signal. We've broken it down into symbol, signal, inner symbol interference, and noise. We've written expressions for the variance of each of these terms. We've taken their ratio and said that we've got to make this big. And we maximize that ratio by doing two things. One, upper bounding the signal term with Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And that tells us that the receive filter should be matched to the transmit filter. The second thing we did is we said that there also should be zero intersymbol interference. And that tells us that we should use a very special filter, a G of T, which is the convolution between GTA and GTX. And that's called a Nyquist pulse shape. And so that's essentially the, the two main things that we've done here. Now, what remains is to see what do these Nyquist pulse shapes look like? You know, what, do they exist? I mean, they do exist, but how interesting are they? And then the second step would be how do we get the GTX and GRX from that? So that's what we would do next. So stop here. Any questions on this, this calculation here? Nope, not, not here. So why are we trying to minimize the inner symbol rather than the noise? Because we, we don't have any control. Um, I mean, here, the problem is that, so when we upper bounded this, we have this quantity here. This is integral of GRX of F. We also have it up here, right? So whatever you do to the filter at this point, you also do do this. So it just doesn't, it doesn't help you. So, so, so there's nothing we can do there. So that's why then we go over here and try to ax that out. I mean, even if the end knot was, was bigger, it wouldn't matter. You'd still end up squishing this down here, right? If we try to make GRX zero? Yeah, the integral of that. Yeah, I mean, but then the problem is that that would, ha that would mean that the, so, so what that GRX of F is, is that's the inner product between GRX. That's the inner product, the, the, essentially the norm of GRX. So that would mean that that function has no energy, basically that it's zero. No. Or it's, you know, except on some whatever measurable set. Um, so it would make it zero. So it would be like taking a received signal and multiplying by zero. And then, yeah. Wouldn't be any fun. <laughs> so other questions? Okay, so uh, that's, you know, the kind of the main technical derivation for today. Now, I'm going to stop for... Hopefully a few minutes here, not get too distracted. This here. So what I have brought just for you to, to play with here is um, two phones from my phone collection here. First one, you may have seen it in a museum, but um, <laughs> I want to show you this here. I'll pass this around. This is the slightly newer version of this phone, circa the 80s. The, the previous version had a bigger battery. So this is the version with the upgraded battery. It doesn't look as much like a brick. Um, this was owned by, I'm not that old, owned by uh, one of my colleagues who retired recently. So he had this phone in the, in the 80s. And, um, you know, you get a sense of, like, 
got a big antenna, it's heavy, it doesn't fit in your pocket, it's got no cool display. So this is the first one here, and I grab this here, and just check this out, pass it around here. And the second one is, this phone is actually was my phone, and it is not that old, uh, but it's not also not that stylish. This I had in, yeah, I don't remember now, this is back 2006 or seven. Um, is this one here. And what's cool about this phone is that it flips open here. So this used the Symbian operating system, the operating system that Nokia had created and essentially, you know, hasn't been successful. But they had all of the ingredients of this. And I was using this before the iPhone came out, you know. So this, this was um, several years before the iPhone. And they, and they had variations of this design actually since um, even 10 or 15 years. You know, so, so this is just an interesting that, you know, Nokia had all the ingredients of developing, like, really cool smartphone and, you know. Anyways, look what happened here. But, yeah, and this is cool. It's had a keyboard. And so a lot of people in IT were getting these because um, you could get a uh, SSH program on here. And so, you know, if the, the, some system goes down or something, yeah, you can SSH on here back into your server and, you know, you can run all kinds of cool things. So, anyways, but I was using this here and this... Doesn't fit in most pockets, at least most jeans pockets. <laughs> Grab that there. But that was pretty cool. And then, you know, I, I got rid of that probably around the, uh, the first generation iPhone, although I went to another phone, not, not the iPhone. So, anyways, yeah, check out that thing. I mean, it's, it's huge, right? I mean, can you even take that phone on the airplane? <laughs> I mean, probably not, because it's pretty much a weapon nowadays. <laughs> so... Yeah. yeah. Any comments on this? Does any of you guys have like your, your parents have one of these? Yeah. Yeah, do you sure remember that? Yeah, I, I remember seeing like this. That was like now it's just like just a couple of them sitting in the closet and collect the tags. Excellent. Give them to me. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty fun. Yeah, I wish I had the one that had the, the thicker battery on it too, just because I think that's even more immense. That's what you see in all the old sitcoms from the eighties. The Kids having that big uh, phone. <laughs> this is pretty cool. And by the way, the battery on this Nokia phone here, battery would last seven days. <laughs> Long time, yeah. And it wasn't operating on 3G. It was, it, um, I think that one didn't support, no, maybe it did support 3G. It didn't support the 3G and the frequencies in the U.S., though. So I was using, like, Edge. But, yeah, I mean, I mean, back in those days, at least for, for the digital phones, before smartphones took off, they were lasting like a week. You didn't have to charge it every day. I mean, my current phone, I won't mention the manufacturer, I have a charger on my desk because if I don't charge it in the middle of the day, it runs out by the end of the day. And I'm not even using it that much. So maybe it's, maybe I abused the battery or something. But anyways, any other comments on these things? Yeah. Demo and I can't even SSH and reboot my server from it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't appealing towards techies really. It was appealing towards consumers, and because it's easy to use. Because this Nokia phone was a pain. I mean, the, the whole the touch. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not powered anymore. I mean, I suppose I could have charged it, but um, I don't remember even that it has a touch screen. You have to use that little joystick on there. You know, so a lot of people, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work to kind of sit there with the joystick and, you know, maneuver it around. <laughs> of course, now you can SSH on your iPhone, so. Or you can um, root it in SSH anyway. Any other comments here? Yeah, people watching the video, you don't get the sense of, you know, how the, uh, <laughs> how immense the, the phone is here. You know, it's just. It's like my hand here. Yeah, it doesn't even fit on the whole. It's basically eight inches long this way, not including the antenna. <laughs> a penny, yes, a penny. <laughs> what is a penny? I, I don't have a penny either. I mean, real money. I could put a penny. I could put that there, that pen there. Let's see how it compares to a pen, just the half of the phone. <laughs> But there's a lot of benefits to this design. I mean, one of the benefits is that look where the antenna is. It's not, it's not spraying radiation into your head. So that's probably one of the few benefits. Now, one of the 
other features, though, is that it puts out a lot more power than phones nowadays because it had to have a lot higher range. And yeah, you can't really see here, but this is a, um, you know, th this screen here is one of these very, very simple, uh, what are these called? Digital? I don't think it's an LED. I mean, it's like the kind of the really, really old digital watches. So there's no, no interesting kind of screen here. And there's a couple buttons here. There's a button that essentially says, oh, yeah, there's three lights. In use, no service, and roam. <laughs> and you get that, and then you get the time, and you can get to punch your number in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's not even enough numbers here to punch in, to see the whole number you're typing in with the area code. Which is kind of intriguing. Hmm. Anyways. Yeah. That's a good question. I'm. It it must have had some memory here because I see an STO button, but you know this was using otherwise completely analog technology, so it probably had. Yeah, there's a name and a menu, so it must have had some way to to store some numbers. But you know you'd have to do that through these little buttons here, punch something in, store, and then you'd have to you know press it a whole bunch of times to type in a name. Well, there's also a volume control too. Except there's only one button, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I should press the button and then press another button here. I think he wants to reach the highest volume and just go right back down. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Just a circle, you just keep pressing and pressing. <laughs> the and there's nothing on the I mean, look, there's, there's nothing on the side, it's totally smooth, and except for these, where you'd sit it in instead of plugging in a charger, you'd sit it in a big uh, cradle, and that's how it would charge. Oh, that's great. Great technology here. I have a car phone too in my bag of stuff. Is it the big one? Because my wife used to tell me her parents had the, the car phone, the first car phone, or whatever. It's it's a um, it's not huge, but it's it's kind of like a little um, medicine bag or something like yeah. you'd use for carry on. Yeah, so it's, right, you had but it's heavy. Right. She said, she was telling me, and I was like, I've never seen one. Yeah, 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 yeah. My my girlfriend when I was in high school, her parents had one of those and. Made her take it with her, you know. <laughs> Gotta keep safe after all. And and that, yeah, it has a big battery and um, it transmitted at a lot more power than this, too. It's a lot of power. Um, so you could, get, you could get 20 mile range with that. So, thank you. So, anyways, that was pretty cool here. All right. Now, back to. Oh, MacWest Pulse Shapes. That's a hard transition. <laughs> All right, so the point of this piece of the lecture is just essentially to talk about this, um, this family of functions that have this weird property. And so we want, we want to say, okay, first of all, what is like the conditions under which this is true. So necessary and sufficient condition for g of nt to be equal to a delta function. Well, we know from, from sampling theory that if we look at this in the frequency domain, right, remember that this g of nt in the time domain, in the frequency domain, it has a um, Fourier transform that looks like 1 over t, sum over k. We can write this in frequency g of f plus k over t is equal to 1 here. Or equivalently, if we look at this in discrete time, we treat this as a discrete time function. What this means is that g of, so let's write g d of <coughs> n is equal to g of n t. So equivalently, our discrete time frequency response, which is again e to j 2 pi f, it's discrete time, periodic, it's going to be equal to the sum over k, g of f t plus k is equal to 1. 
So these functions look very strange, but essentially all we did is just take the Fourier transform here of both sides. But effectively what this says is that this signal, when aliased, has a constant value. So in discrete time, for example, you know, that alias signal looks like this. In continuous time, that alias signal looks like this. The only difference is the scaling factor that happens when we go from continuous to discrete here. So you can have, you know, this this is this sequence here. This is like the pulse train of functions here. So, you know, however it looks, when they add up, it should be flat here. So essentially, if, the, if this is true, then this is true, and vice versa. And this is, um, follows basically just from the Fourier transform here. So now the, now the question is, you know, what are the classes of functions that satisfy this or equivalently this, this property here? And so these are the Nyquist pulse shaping functions. And um, the, the simplest example is what I just showed you there, which is the sync function here. So let's call this G of sync of T is equal to sine of pi T over capital T. You have to be careful of the scaling function here, pi T over capital T. So let's look at that in the time domain. So if we evaluate this G sync at T equals, let's say, NT here, right? We're going to get sine of pi of N over pi of N. And what does this function look like? What is the value at 0? And what is the value at N equals 1, N equals 2? What the value at N equals 0? That's 1. And what's the value at N equals 1? 0 and n equals 2, it's 0, etc. Now, if we plot this out here, so what we're going to get is we're going to have a function, the usual sync function here. And the only thing you have to pay attention to is that we've scaled the sync by t here. So instead of these zeros happening at 1, 2, 3, 4, they're happening at t, 2t, 3t, 4t. So this crossing here is at t, this crossing is at 2t, this crossing is at 3t, etc. This is at minus t minus 2t, et cetera, this is 1. <coughs> so then if we sample this, we get a, you know, this right here. <coughs> so this gives you a really good visual of what these kinds of functions look like. You know, they're wiggly because, they, I mean, they have to have all these zeros here, and then they have a 1 there. So if we want to find other functions, we've got to play with whatever's in between all these different points here. Now, in the frequency domain, you might say, oh, well, okay, what about the frequency domain? Well, we have to go through here and remember, right, the Fourier transform of the sink. The sink is going to be the rectangle function. And that rectangle function is normally 1 over 2, 1 half. This is going to be um, 1 over 2t. Two and then the replicas, where do they occur? Well, the replicas occur every 1 over t. So I'm going to draw, and then this, this whole thing here should be scaled by, in this case, 1 over t. So I'm going to draw another replica here. This is the one that sits at 1 over t. And so in the frequency domain, this is basically just a whole bunch of blocks that are flattened out together, and then they look totally flat. So this is the 1 over t, sum over k, g of f plus k t. 
I think I have the scaling right here. Let me see. I think so, yeah. Okay, so that's, I mean, the, the typical example, the sync function. So essentially, if we use just a very simple sync at the transmitter, so, so the bandwidth of the sync, the bandwidth is going to be, the baseband bandwidth is going to be 1 over 2t. Remember, t is our symbol period, so 1 over t is our symbol rate. So the passband bandwidth is going to be 1 over t, our symbol rate. So they're, they're tightly connected together. So the faster you send symbols, the, um, you know, the more, the closer these two points are, and the wider the bandwidth here with the sync function. Now that's good. The, the problem is that with the sync is that, um, you know, we, we can't implement any of these filters in practice because, you know, we can really only implement um, some approximations of these, uh, typically in like an FIR or either some kind of an IR type approximation of the filter here. And normally we, we would truncate this here. And so some of the issues are, you know, that's usually truncated. And one property of the sync function, you might remember this from signals and systems, you might not here, is that the way that these tail rolls off is, is essentially it's like proportional to 1 over t. So what that means is that there's a lot of energy in the, the tail here. And so you have to actually truncate it a lot to get um, a good filter here. Um, another issue is that it's non-causal. But this isn't a big problem because if we make it FIR, we can essentially just add a delay in the system here. So we can always make causal with delay. So that's not a big deal. And then the other issue is it turns out that there's um, potential for timing errors. And this is going to be a topic that we deal with in probably three lectures. But essentially, the whole derivation of this is assuming that at the receiver, we sample at precisely the right point. And if you don't sample at exactly that point, what you're going to do is you're going to pick up little bits of this little piece of tail. And because there's so much energy in the tails there, you're going to pick up a lot of inner symbol interference. So it's very sensitive to timing errors. And so that's, that's another of the typical problems with it. So that's the, that's the sync um, standard example here. Now let's look at um, the other example that um, we need to, to consider here. And this is the, the raised cosine. OK, so the raised cosine pulse shape, um, yeah. It looks like, let's call it GRC of t, which is equal to the sine of pi t over t divided by pi t over t. That's the sync function. Times, oops, cosine of pi alpha of t divided by 1 minus 4 alpha squared t squared over capital T squared here. So intuitively with the, the raised cosine, what we're doing is we're taking the sync function and we are um, multiplying it by this other function in time. This is called a window. And so by windowing it, we're going to smooth it in the frequency domain, but we're going to reduce the, the side lobes in the time domain. Now the frequency domain function, it's uh, oh, so not fun to write, but it looks like this here for t. 0 less than or equal to absolute value of f, less than or equal to 1 minus alpha over 2t. It's t over 2 times 1 plus cosine pi t over alpha, absolute value of f minus 1 minus alpha over 2t. Hint, don't try to memorize this one. Write it in your cheat sheet. 1 over alpha 2t, less than or equal to f, less than or equal to 1 plus alpha over 2t. And then it's otherwise going to be 0 for f greater than 1 plus alpha over 2t. 
So I'll have a plot of this here in a minute here, but the things to notice here is, first of all, that it's flat part of the time. This alpha parameter here, alpha is between 0 and 1. If alpha is equal to 0, then this becomes 1 over 2t, and it becomes a sinc function. If alpha is equal to 1, then this flat part goes away, and you get this, this thing here. And then look at this here, 1 plus alpha over 2t. This is the maximum bandwidth. And so we call this alpha greater than 0. This leads to what's called excess bandwidth. Because the bandwidth is going to be 1 over alpha over 2t, and it's in excess of the 1 over 2t, which you'd get with the sinc function. All right, so let's look at um, a couple plots of this here. So first of all, this is what it looks like in the time domain. This is slide 7 here. So this is the time domain. Ah. Yuck. All right. So you can see um, the blue here is the sync function. You can sort of see blue. The, uh, the green is alpha of 0 0.5, and the red is alpha of 1. And what ideally you could see is that the zero crossings are all the same, but that the tail here is getting much smaller. So this, this red is with alpha equals 1. And look how low that first bump is. With alpha equals 1 half, it's a little bit higher. And so as you increase the alpha, you go from this down to here and down to here. So the main lobe it gets actually a little bit wider, but mostly it's the side lobes that we're really attenuating. And this makes sense because we're windowing it. If you plot this, um, if you were to plot this, this function right here, you would see that it does something like this. So it tends to attenuate the side lobes. Now, let's look at the frequency domain. So this is going to be 8. So in the frequency domain, um, ooh. Okay. So in the frequency domain, this blue here is the, the sync function. This is normalized here with, you know, so this point right here should be, this is 1 half, so this should be like 1 over 2t. This point here, this is alpha equals 0.5, so this is going to be 1.5 over 2t. This here is going to be 2 over T. And so what you can see is that as you increase alpha, you use more bandwidth here, because you go from here to here. And also what you can notice is that we've smoothed this edge. You remember from things like um, the Skibbs effect that whenever you have this sharp edge here, it always creates some problem. You know, when you, when you try to compute Fourier transform and do something with it in a practical way, that little Ripley effect always hurts you here. So we're also smoothing it out and getting rid of that discontinuity. So anyways, that's the raised cosine in the, the frequency domain here. So the final point I want to make here is the um, comment that how do we get the... Uh, sorry, let me make sure here. Yeah, okay. 8, 9 here. Oh, yeah, so, for, so let me give you the, the parameters here. So the um, 1 plus alpha over 2t is the absolute bandwidth. And this is at baseband. And if this is the absolute bandwidth, then our um, then our um, signal would have to be sampled at at least twice that rate. So we would say that the um, Nyquist rate is one over alpha over t. So that's the Nyquist rate of that signal. 
Because remember, the bandwidth of the pulse shape determines the bandwidth of our transmitted signal. So if we have excess bandwidth, we are expanding the bandwidth of X of T. And then um, also 1 plus alpha over T is the passband bandwidth. Passband absolute bandwidth. And then let's see here. Um, and then 1 over T is the sampling rate. Is the, so this is the symbol sampling rate. This is not the Nyquist sampling rate here. So the weird thing is, you know, we sample our received signal at less than the Nyquist rate because the Nyquist rate would be um, 1 plus alpha over T. So we sample at less than that. And then the final thing is just that the best decay you can get with the raised cosine is sort of a 1 over T cubed. So you can essentially make the tails of that function fall off quickly. So um, the, the one sticky point here is that we need GTRX and GTX, which we don't have. So we can recall that G of F should be equal to GTX of F, GRX of F, which is equal to GTX of F, G conjugate TX of F because of that mesh filter property here. And so then it's possible to, to factor these functions. Not easy, but has already been done. And for example, with the rate for the sync function, the sync function is its own mesh filter. So there's nothing to be done there. But for the raised cosine, we can get what's called the square root raised cosine. And this one has the rather, um, it actually has a very intuitive form of something that looks like this. Yeah, very intuitive. Um, so anyways, that's, you know, it's in the book here. And, and so if you wanted to design a system that had a, a raised cosine equivalent pulse shape G of T, you would use the square root raised cosine at the transmitter and receiver. And then the match filter would give you, when you match them together, you'd get the G of T, which is the, the raised cosine. Okay, so any questions about this raised cosine? Properties, rate. Well, it's being taken care of because it's a very special function. So, um, and that it's being taken care of because we're requiring that when we sample this function. We get this property here. So Nyquist is really about, you know, any arbitrary band-limited function can be represented from its samples if sampled at um, a sufficient rate. But this is not any arbitrary function. This is a very special function. So this very special function, um, when sampled, gives you this special delta here. But what if you were trying to reconstruct this? What would you get? Well, I mean, you'd, you'd get, you, you wouldn't get the original function back, right? If I, if I give you a discrete time delta as the input sequence, you're going to pass that into a sync filter. So the output you'll get is a sync. But that's not what we sampled. So you actually, I mean, the, the, this is a special function. When you sample it, you lose information. You don't get to re recover it because of the aliasing. Does that make any sense? <laughs> no. <laughs> Yes? No? No. Okay. Um, so what if we sampled a function and it was all zero? Right, you could do that. I can give you a sine wave that we can sample, and we sample it exactly at the crossing points, and we get zero. 
And that, that function, you can't recover it because that's in general, yes. Right, but the thing is that what we're, what, what we're, we are not trying to sample, yeah, let me go back here. This is, actually, this, this feeds exactly into the next part of the lecture here. Um, okay, I've lost my block diagram. My block diagram. Oh, here it is. Okay, all right. So notice that we're not trying to sample the received signal so that we, we can reconstruct it with perfect fidelity. We don't care about that. All we are trying to do is get the symbols out. So this, that's, that's where signal processing and digital communication are diverging. Because the signal processing person would say, yes, we have sampled this at greater than Nyquist, so we can get all the information there is in that signal from a signal processing perspective. Here, all we want to know is what is the symbol that was sent? And what is the information contained in that symbol? That's it. So it's a different, it's a different problem. And so essentially by designing this pulse shape in this very special way, we are allowed to undersample the received signal and yet still recover the symbols we sent. But after that sampling, we cannot regenerate the signal we sampled because it doesn't satisfy Nyquist. But we still get the symbols. And in fact, we could regenerate it because if we know the symbols, we know the, the pulse shaping filter. Yeah, but we don't know the noise. No. That's the idea. All right, now we're going to connect this back to DSP. So we're going to go through 9, okay, 10 here. So we're now going to talk about how do I do this at the transmitter? How do I implement pulse shaping at the transmitter? Supposing we have a pulse shape here. And so the idea is to essentially get rid of, ah, oh, where did this go here? The idea is to now replace this block here with something else that has more um, meaning in terms of digital signal processing. So what we're going to do is, so this is, this is pulse shaping the transmitter, and we can ideally finish this here. So if I have a transmitted signal, this is my transmitted signal. This is the signal I'm transmitting here. This is band limited because I'm using band limited pulse shape here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a new signal here, x tilde of t. I'm just going to take this and push that in there. This new signal looks like Sum over m. Um, sorry, I'm just going to write this piece of this s of m g t x of t minus m t. So I'm just going to look at the signal before the scaling operation. That's just just to avoid dealing with that square root of e x. Because this is band limited, there exists a sample period t x and a sequence, C of n, such that this is also equal to the sum over m, C of m, sine pi t minus m t x over t x divided by pi t minus m t x over t x here. All this is is the reconstruction formula from Nyquist sampling theorem. So no matter what pulse shaping filter I have, as long as it's band limited, this pulse shaped sequence of symbols can equivalently be represented as a linear combination of shifted sync functions. That's just from Nyquist. So now the question is, how does C and Tx relate to Sm and Gtx here. Well, we also know this from Nyquist. How do we get Cm? We get Cm is just equal to this. That's all. We just sample our signal. But 
that's equal to the sum over, let's see, I'm using m here. Uh, I'm going to use another letter here. Use n over here. S of n, g t x of n t x, sorry, m t x minus n t. Look at this here. x, no x. But this is it. This is how I get the cm coefficients. Now, to simplify this further, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to suppose that Tx equals T over L for an integer L that's greater than 0. This is called um, oversampling here. But, so we're going to assume that, the, yeah, the Tx is essentially smaller than, so, so we're assuming that the sample period is some integer fraction of the symbol period. And so then we can rewrite that C of n as the sum over, so sorry, I'm going to switch the notation back here, corresponding to my notes here, sum over C of m, S of m, GTx of NTx minus MLTx here. So this right here. Now this looks like a convolution with the sum over m, s of m, delta of n minus m l, convolved with a sampled function g t x of n, where g t x of n is g of t x at sampled at this here. So going from here to here may look magical, but it happens that this right here is a, is a signal processing operation, and that's called upsampling. So I could call this signal right here, let me call it S bar of n. We actually have a signal processing block called the upsampler that takes S of n and generates S bar of n. And if you look at what it's doing here, what this does is this takes an incoming sequence S here. So this would be S of 0. It inserts L minus 1 zeros. And then I get S1, L minus 1 zeros, S2, etc. here. So this whole thing here is S bar of n. So that's an upsampler. And so how you do that in, well, you just insert zeros. Or you use the upsampling function in LabVIEW. And so we take the output here of this upsampler, and we pass that through a digital filter, gtx of n. And then what we need at the output of that is a discrete to continuous converter operating at Tx, which is equal to T over L. And so this is our new block diagram here now. Bits, symbol map, upsample by L, Gtx of n, D to C, square root of e x, x of t, here. So I've just given you another way to create that transmitted signal x of t that involves symbol mapping, which we do in digital, upsampling, which we do in digital, digital filtering, and then a discrete to continuous converter, or a digital to analog converter, as you like. And so this is how we're going to implement the pulse shaping of the transmitter. So, you all, so to get this, all you have to do is take your transmit pulse shaping filter and sample it at the sample rate. And the only tricky thing here is that I'm, I'm assuming that the sample rate, which would be the rate your digital to analog converter works at, is an integer, um, is, is an integer div div divisor of this symbol. Well, the sample rate should be a multiple of the symbol rate. So that's it.
Now, there's a way to get around this using what's called a resampling operation. All right, so that's it for today. Um, I will probably give you a homework assignment here that involves this upsampling operation here. There is another way to, to do this convolution here that uses much lower complexity because I'm convolving a sequence with a bunch of zeros. There's, so there's a way to rewrite this using what's called the filter bank that's even more efficient. And that's what's done in software-defined radio. Uh, so we'll do a little bit of that uh, here, but that's pretty much it here. And then, oh, the final thing I forgot was that this sampling operation here in the frequency domain, s bar e to the j 2 pi f is equal to s e to the j 2 pi f over l. Ah, didn't fit. So that's part of the upsampling identity here. All right. So let's see. So I mean, the main things we've done today here. So design the pulse optimum pulse shape that maximizes the SINR. It's a match filter. It's a Nyquist pulse shape. Number two, what is a Nyquist pulse shape? And specifically that you know the bandwidth excess bandwidth sampling frequency of the raised cosine. And that if I give you a pulse shape, you can determine if it's a Nyquist pulse shape. How you would do that? Sample it, see if it's a delta. If not, it's not a, it's not a Nyquist pulse shape. Or you can the frequency domain. Finally, how we implement pulse shaping at the transmitter, we're going to use an upsampling operation followed by a digital filtering, followed by a discrete to continuous conversion. And you're going to implement that in the lab if you haven't done it already. All right, that's it. Yes? Um, are there examples of 